So um, as advertised, uh, I'm Chris Wiggins, and I split my time between New York Times and Columbia. This will be a bit of a hybrid talk because uh, I thought I would speak about a very high level about data science at the New York Times, and then I watched videos of the last few events from the Data Science Institute, and there was some good serious math in there. So I, uh, there will also be the, the second half will have more serious math in it. Uh, and that'll be the hybrid aspect of it. Um, also, if you want to know more, um, we had a lot of, a lot of a, my collaborators and I had a lot of time on our hands during the pandemic, so we wrote two books. Um, if you want to know more, the class that I'm teaching on the history and ethics of data is now a book on the left, which I'm teaching with a history professor, Matt Jones, uh, who's a historian of science. And then also I wrote a book more, pra more for practitioners uh, with Alfred Spector and Peter Norvig and Jeanette Wing, and those both should be available this year. So then, uh, today, I really wanted to talk about data science at the New York Times, but first I thought I would talk a bit about data science. This is a data science event. Um, my personal perspective on data science, uh, Alex alluded to, uh, in that I had been working on biology. So I was a, my PhD was in physics, but I was applying physical methods to biology, which in the 90s was sort of an audacious thing to try to do. And while I was doing my PhD, uh, Something special happened in 1995. I can still remember Tim Holly walking into the Burger King on Nassau Street in Princeton holding this cover of Science Magazine and saying, well, this is going to change everything because once you can sequence Haemophilus, which is the thing that's on the right, is the first critter to have its sequence sequenced. Um, then once you can sequence Haemophilus, which had been understood for 100 years using pictures like on the left, then you can sequence you know, rice and mice and chickens and people and then multiple people and then the whole relationship between biology and, and numbers is going to change, which it did. Uh, so by the time I finished my PhD in the late 90s, uh, biology was very interested in data. Uh, so biology really changed for good and, and that sort of experience of watching a field suddenly have an abundance of data, not a lot of clear models to connect with, but still trying to make sense of the data in light of, in this case, 100 years of understanding something, I think that sort of pain is common to many different fields. I'll call that pain data science. Uh, and I'll talk about some of that happening at the New York Times. So uh, in, this was a good example of, of a change in technology. And the change in technology really caused people to start thinking differently about what does it mean to understand and, and what is a good scientific result, et cetera, et cetera. It was an exciting time. Um, as an evidence of that, of it being exciting times, there's a quote from Shirley Tillman, who went on to be the president of Princeton. At the time, she was a, 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 already a very well-respected molecular biologist at Princeton. And uh, I can remember, again, you know, there was a time when biologists didn't really want to talk to people who looked at numbers. And then by the end of the, that decade, you get essays like this, Shirley Tillman saying, these are exciting times. Phylogenetic trees, which is a mindset that had been around ever since Charles Darwin said so in 1836, that we should think about evolutionary trees. And we attacked it by simply making a decision tree, which is just the algorithmic approach, uh, to try to figure out, if I give you the genome, can you figure out, is this more like the genome of viruses that have been evolving in birds or evolving in pigs, so to speak? Which, which by the way, sounds like an academic question, but at the time, you know, there were articles about whether or not the government of China was going to kill all the birds or kill all the pigs. So it was a very applied question at the time. Um, and it was an example of how when you are collaborating with somebody from another discipline, it's not always about statistical performance. It's often a challenge in which your collaborators actually do want some interpretable model. This was a conversation I was having with two students uh, a few days ago here is that um, sometimes they're working on methods that are, are performant, but nobody really understands how they work. It's, it's a dialogue that's happening. Many of the things that people are doing today is um, somewhere between the two, trying to build methods that we know are statistically performant, but also are useful to somebody in another discipline. And again, that's, I think, part of the multidisciplinary story of data science. If you'd like to know more, there's a good essay about it from decades ago. 
So for example, in this approach, we just it was an example of trying to take machine learning methods and apply it to a problem from a different domain in order to get um, a method that works statistically, but is also interpretable, in this case, a decision tree being an A plus example of something that um, it just asks yes or no questions. And at the end, you get a quantitative uh, likelihood of something being from the, in this case, the pig class rather than the bird class. OK, so that is the mindset I'm coming from, is the mindset of uh, a natural scientist applying machine learning, mostly, to um, collaborations with people from other disciplines. And I, and I hope to illustrate how that is going on internal to many companies in the real world, but in particular at the New York Times. Um, so why, how did this come to be called data science? So just to, with the data science event, so a few words on, on what people mean when they say the word data science. Um, uh, uh, many people in outside of academia, particularly in industry, when they say data science, uh, their worldview, I think, was influenced by writings by people at tech companies uh, where they made up a new job title, data scientist. Uh, and then data science is whatever the data scientist did. So for example, there was this nice essay by Jeff Hammerbacher after he left uh, Facebook in 2009. And he states, uh, at Facebook, we felt like traditional titles didn't quite catch it. Uh, because somebody on our team would be doing all these different things. They might be doing uh, data processing and pipeline, doing a hypothesis test, doing regression in R, building a data intensive product, and communicating the results to the rest of the organization in a clear and concise fashion. And so we made up a new job title, data scientist. It is fun, as somebody who's doing data science in industry, to look back on this paragraph you know, 13 years later and see how many things have changed and how many things have stayed the same. And one thing that I do think is the same in academia and industry when people say data science is often they're looking for a quantitative person who is able to communicate the results of analyses to other members of an organization or of a community in a clear and concise fashion. Things that have changed include the tools themselves. So uh, at least at the New York Times, we're no longer using R. We're no longer using Hadoop. Uh, all of these things are being done in Python or TensorFlow. And the thing that used to be Hadoop is now happening in Google's cloud platform. So a lot of the problems have gone away, which is good, because now a student can go from zero to deep learning in, in, in two minutes. OK, uh, another beast, uh, bit of history. Um, I'm, there were other people writing about uh, data science at the industry academia intersection, including Jan LeCun, who's well known to many people in the room. Uh, Jan wrote this data science manifesto. Uh, back in 2009, slightly revised over the years. Uh, so I think Jan was also ahead of the curve and pointing out to people that there was a new kind of science brewing. Um, and of course, Jan himself had, had already had uh, a foot, well, both feet in industry for a long time. Uh, and he sort of saw that there's an opportunity for academia and industry to collaborate in new ways and to create a new field. Uh, and of course, industry had been leading this even earlier. This is a, a paper that most people don't talk about when they talk about what even do we talk about when we talk about data science. Uh, it's a great paper from Bill Cleveland. Bill Cleveland was an example of one of many heretical statisticians at Bell Labs. Uh, there was a whole, basically, group of heretical computational statisticians who every 10 years, one of them would write a paper about the gap between mathematical statistics as it had been evolving since, you know, since the time of Jersey name and into the into DMS, <laughs> into the particular division of, of the way we think about mathematics, and that, that gap between that and the way industry was looking at data. And I think by having a field of data science that is a much more porous connection between the way people think about large data sets in industry and the way we can think mathematically about them in academia, uh, it's uh, creating a new field. Okay, a more pithy description of what we talk about when we talk about data science at the New York Times was from this cartoon by the um, NYU graduate student Drew Conway 12 years ago, uh, in which he was trying to uh, piece together conversations that were happening in New York City at the time around data science. And he made this little Venn diagram, uh, arguing that data science was a new craft, uh, the craft of trying to apply machine learning to some domain, some domain where there already is substantive expertise. And implicit in this graph is that um, there is a danger zone if you do this in a way that is unprincipled, because as is often said, uh, if you torture the data enough, they will confess to anything. So it's important when you have some real data set from a very complicated situation that you approach that data set with some sort of principled approach. 
Uh, that is the mindset that I've used in trying to argue at the New York Times that there is, um, there's a possibility that machine learning could be useful to the New York Times. I sometimes say that the data science team uh, is driven by a hypothesis, the hypothesis that machine learning could be useful uh, to the New York Times. So how did that happen? Well, it happened via sabbatical. So I took a sabbatical from Columbia in fall of 2013 uh, and went to a group that at the time was called Business Intelligence rolled up my sleeves, wrote some really bad um, machine learning code, uh, and then at the end of it uh, went back to academia but said, you know, we have an opportunity here to, um, to show that machine learning can be useful for a lot of problems at the New York Times generally. And that's the way um, I've tried to help the New York Times build up a data science team uh, by developing and deploying machine learning solutions to newsroom and business problems. So the deploy there is something that's um, mostly outside of our academic conception of data science, but there, there is a lot of challenge in um, not only de designing the algorithm, thinking about how to model a data set, but also thinking about how to turn that into a product. Right? Often in academia, the results of our data science ends with a PDF, maybe with a website, but um, in industry, the insights from a PDF are nice, but that's not what people mean by data science. In fact, in the Jeff Hammerbacher quote, it's explicit. Building uh, and deploying a data intensive product is, is one of the drivers of data science in industry. Good, and so today I'll tell you a little bit about what, how we think about machine learning and about the kinds of newsroom and business problems uh, that we use machine learning for at the New York Times. So now I've told you a bit about data science as we've thought about it. I've given you some historical landmarks in the development of data science as an idea. Uh, now I need to talk about where that sits at the New York Times. So a reasonable question for people who are not employees of the New York Times is to think about the New York Times as a newspaper. Uh, it is a newspaper. It has been a newspaper since 1851. So there are certainly ways that people who are not at the New York Times see data in the New York Times, mostly in data visualization, uh, data journalism. But I want to be clear that that is not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about things that require machine learning. So the data vision visualization is awesome and cool, and the data journalism is awesome and cool. But um, I'm going to be talking about things where machine learning is really needed, uh, which is less so for awesome data journalism, da data journalism and data graphics. Um, and so it, this, so the data journal, the machine learning I'm talking about today is not something that happens in the newsroom. Uh, or as sometimes people say at the New York Times, there's a church-state divide between church, which is the newsroom, and state is sort of everything else. Uh, and one of the things that's happened at the New York Times in the last six years uh, is the creation of a centralized data group, which helps both the church and the state. So at the New York Times, the, uh, with the data science team reports up to a person who's in charge of data, whose reports to somebody who then reports both to the head editor and to the CEO, both. So data stands in this sort of uh, interesting liminal place at the New York Times where we try to put data to work both for newsroom and business problems. How would you do that? Well, you can create new products. Again, as I emphasize from the Jeff Hammerbacher quote, data science in industry often means building a data product um, or trying to change people's process. I'll show you some illustrations. There are ways that we try to enhance news judgment rather than replace news judgment. So important to the New York Times is that it has editors who are very, very good at their jobs. So um, there are things that I could do with machine learning that would effectively be in replacing them. That would be in nobody's interest. That would not be a good idea. Instead, we're trying to figure out how can we use machine learning to enhance the craft that they already have, uh, and then to continue letting the readers speak. There are ways that we can use data to understand how our readers interact with the, um, with the New York Times news. Okay. Another challenge, as I said, about data science is that it's often multidisciplinary, which means you may find as a technologist that you can't use technologist words with your multidisciplinary collaborators. So that's certainly true applying machine learning in biology, but it's also true applying machine learning in industry. So I try not to talk about the machine learning methods I am using. I try to talk about um, what is it that my collaborators want me to do with their data. Do they want me to build a simple description? Do they want me to predict something that's going to happen in the absence of treatment? Or do they want me to, to pres prescribe what is the right treatment that's going to drive a particular outcome? Um, and the, the third of those is in many ways the most valuable, but it's the most work. It means that you've thought through not only what is it that probably matters, what is it that you're trying to achieve, but what are the levers you're willing to pull in order to try to get that result? 
So secretly in inside my group, I say this is really just the three types of machine learning, unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning. But again, I try not to use those words with my collaborators. With my collaborators, I try to talk about description and prediction and prescription. OK, so an example of description. Um, an example of description was the way the New York Times used to do its recommendation engine. So I'll, I'll tell you how we used to do it and how we do it now. So it used to be that if you went to the New York Times homepage and New York Times was recommending articles to you, it was in a wee little box on the lower right-hand side. And it was done in sort of a structureless feed. Structureless feed meaning you might be recommended an article about books or an article about hard news or you know, a, an opinion piece or a piece about real estate and they would all be in one sort of structureless feed. Um, so one way to do that is to think about the inference problem. So inference in the statistical inference sense of the word. So uh, one of the ways we, we approached that many years ago was to try to um, learn a topic model from the articles. So to be able to say for every article, this article is a mixture of politics and art or sports or something else. Uh, and then to use that sort of embedding, I mean, we would, we would use fancier methods for embedding now, but topic modeling as a way of, of quantizing uh, what is this article really about. That then is something that you can easily combine with how people engage with the articles. And in fact, this was uh, uh, proposed in a paper by uh, my Columbia colleague, Dave Bly, uh, back in 2011, uh, to build a graphical model. So a graphical model, if you haven't seen it, is a, is a graphical representation of a probability model. In this case, the probability model means uh, once I know the topic, which here is Z, that topic Z implies a distribution of words, W, uh, over all the different documents. Uh, and there are also readers, or, or there's a user, I should say, a user U who has a set of interests. Uh, and depending on how that user's interests interact with the topic in the document, then you can predict how the user is going to engage with that document. So that was a type of... Uh, uh, recommendation approach that we were trying in 2015. Uh, it's, it was a t uh, an approach called collaborative topic modeling uh, by Dave Bly and coworkers. Uh, and that was an example of how we were doing recommendation back in 2015. So it's not directly trying to predict what's going to happen in the absence of treatment. It's not directly trying to prescribe what you should do. It's trying to build one simple description of all the documents in the word, all the words in the documents, and all the ways the different readers interact with those documents. Uh, this is a topic, this is also a, an approach that's uh, gotten a lot of leverage in other fields of research. For example, uh, with other co collaborators at the Columbia's Medical School, we had done something very similar to take a topic model for um, analysis of electronic health records. So it's an extremely flexible approach. It gives some interpretability to your domain experts because you can say to your domain expert, this article is a combination of politics and art, for example. Or to the doctors, you can say this patient record is a combination of these recognized uh, phenotypes. Uh, but it allows you to summarize very quickly a large corpus of documents. Right. And in this case, we, had, we also produced some rendering of which types of topics were overrepresented for a given patient's electronic health records. That description, though, um, still requires you to figure out, like, well, what is it that you want to happen, and what is it that you're willing to do in order to get that thing to happen, which is a, an applied question in industry. So there are many qu um, other questions in industry where the right tool for the right job is not statistical inference. It's straightforward supervised learning. Uh, the most common example, if you ever find yourself engaging with anyone who works at any company that has a subscription model, is they will be interested in predicting which, people, which subscribers are going to cancel their subscription. It's, it's extremely common. Uh, so if you ever find yourself talking to someone from Spotify, Netflix, or any other, or any newspaper, any digital subscription service, they'll probably be interested in the thing that in academia would be called supervised learning. And in fact, um, in, in fact, that was the first thing I proposed to the people I was working with at the New York Times was we really should build this kind of model. And it was an obvious thing for, thing for me to do because it's the kind of thing I'd been doing for looking at, you know, genomics and functional genomics uh, 20 years ago. Uh, trying to predict which genes were going to be overrepresented or underrepresented, for example. It's, it's a natural first sort of prism into a new data set. Is to ask, how does this data set perform under the prism of supervised learning? Or under the prism of supervised learning with this method and that method, where at this point the methods are so well understood that we all are building some, some data instinct for how a different data set performs under SVM or under XJBoost or under a decision tree or something else. 
So we did that. Uh, so one of the first things we did at the New York Times was to try to predict for our subscribers um, which ones we're going to cancel. And rapidly, I had the same experience I had working with biologists, which is that the marketers said, that's great that you can predict the at-risk individuals, but what we really want to know is the risky behaviors. They really would like to get some sort of causal model out of observational data, which uh, is a problem. Right? People have been trying for hundreds of years to derive causality from observational data. Um, it's a whole field. So I can't tell you in much detail about uh, which features turned out to matter, but that was one of the things that we worked on first, was trying to build models that were both predictable but also interpretable to our, um, to our co uh, I would say, multidisciplinary friends. And again, this is something that I had known well going, up to the, going to the New York Times because it's the kind of thing we used to do with uh, microarray data. We used to try to predict which genes were going to be upregulated and downregulated but what you really want to do is predict it as a function of, in this case, transcription factor binding sites. So it was a very similar uh, challenge, which is, again, why I say there are a lot of commonalities in data science and industry and academia. Often you have a very complicated data set. You're working with somebody from a domain. They have a way of representing the world. And part of the challenge is to figure out how I can use these awesome statistically performant methods in a way that has some interpretation that's useful to my friends from this other domain. Right. And, and again, uh, just going back to Leo Bryman's article 20 years ago, this is not a new conundrum. Uh, Bryman was writing about this quite explicitly 20 years ago uh, when he wrote that um, random forest, for example, which was one of his methods, are, are great predictors, but they're, they rate an F for interpretability, whereas decision trees rate an A+. Plus. So I'm not saying you should be using trees or forests, but um, it's an example of how it's there's a lot of literature about this challenge about trying to make sense of complex systems from the complex data sets from the real world. Okay, and again, it also relates to, I think it's useful to actually think about your human collaborators. What do they actually want? Um, my marketing friends, again, they want to know who are the at-risk individuals, but what they really want to know is what levers should they be pulling in order to get people not to cancel? So it's, what they really want is a prescription, not a prediction. Um, another case where we were able to put predictive modeling to work was in an, an act. We've done a few uh, collaborations now that I would characterize as computer-assisted reporting. It is occasionally the case that a, uh, a reporter, in this case Hiroko Tabuchi, has access to a very large data set, for example, the set of all federal re federally recorded um, accident reports, uh, and she wants to figure out which of those accidents might be associated with a particular um, faulty airbag, in this case. Uh, so we worked with her where she labeled a couple of stories as being interesting or boring, and then we built a classifier which could predict for all of these uh, fatality records which ones might be interesting to her. Uh, we made it somewhat interpretable by uh, using logistic regression with a little bags, bag of little words, uh, and there are obvious phrases that mean that are correlated with Hiroko Tabuchi finding this incident of interest, like suddenly deployed or inadvertently or burned, and then there are other phrases which, if they occur, she's less likely to be interested in them, like Volkswagen or Mercedes or VW, which uh, were, not the, were not the companies that purchased this particular set of airbags, um, or deployed but or never deployed uh, would be indicators that she doesn't want to use that. So that's an example of trying to build something that is both performant and interpretable, because a human being is going to want to actually trust that machine learning model. Uh, and the more interpretable it is, the more, the more the human being will actually trust it. And that led to a set of uh, reporting stories, which eventually led to a, a recall of that particular company, or, or that particular airbag. Um, another supervised learning challenge, which you may have heard about, is uh, trying to deal with image data. So image data um, are complex. The raw pixels themselves don't come to you with any sort of human interpretable features. Uh, and this was a case where we didn't spend a lot of time thinking about interpretability. We just wanted to help editors who are trying to um, to tone or to change the photo balance of all of the images that somewhere between a person's camera and actually becoming ink have to be rebalanced so that it has the right color balance. So we have this incredible data set of before and after images, and we were able to learn a deep learning model that could basically solve the cold start problem for the editor and give the editor a suggestion for here's how we think you will likely um, rebalance this photo to get the right color scheme that'll work well when it eventually becomes print. OK, and, and again, on, you know, there's thousands of images recorded every day, so we actually get a large data set to work with for this. But it's not, some, it's not something for which we particularly need interpretability. It's, it's a real engineering task. OK, 
those were all examples of supervised learning and inference, I would say, useful at the New York Times. Uh, and as I've alluded to several times, often what people really want is they want to know what decision to make. They don't want to know what's going to happen in the absence of treatment. They want to know what's the right treatment in order to get the outcome they want. So in turn, or at the New York Times, I would call that a prescriptive, a prescriptive model, uh, which I think is useful for reminding people that correlation is not causation. Uh, or as I like to say, causation causes correlation, which is why they're correlated. So it's it, it basically, it, it, it's easy for people to be confused about the fact that you can't actually learn what are the drivers from an observational model. So I'll give two examples of, of times that we tried to help people with decision support. Uh, the first, um, an old one, uh, had its origin in a report that the New York Times newsroom wrote about innovation back in 2014, which they called the Innovation Report. And the Innovation Report opens uh, by saying that the New York Times is falling behind at the art and science of getting journalism to readers, which may sound paradoxical. If you think about a newspaper as a newspaper, you just sell the newspaper. Uh, but in the digital world, when you finish your relationship with a story and you hit publish, that's where you start a new craft, which is called audience development which is figuring out like, how do I promote this story? Do I simply put it on the homepage? Do I put it in different positions on the mobile app? Do I post it on Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, who knows what? And then do I post it on which subchannel? And when do I post it? So there's a whole uh, uh, complex set of actions that editors engage in to try to figure out how do we promote that story. So. Um, the machine learning aspect of this is challenging, but not impossible. It's, it's trying to figure out, based on observational data, can I make a model that predicts how much engagement, for an appropriate definition of engagement, a story will get as a function of attributes of the story and as a function of attributes of how it's promoted. If you can do that, then you can interpret that model in such a way that uh, it says to an editor, if you promote this story on the following channel, you will get much more of that engagement. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's an attempt to use observational data to suggest actions. But that's just the modeling part. The challenge is how do you get editors to use it? So we rapidly found out editors will not use Python. And we couldn't get editors to stop their normal life and then open up a new web app. Instead, what we realized is the editors are already using Slack. So Slack is a chat program. Uh, but it has the advantage that the chat program is very programmable. You can write a chatbot that interacts with them. And so they're effectively calling a machine learning model, but to them it just feels like they're hanging out in the chat program that they're using all day anyway. So that's an example of how data science and industry includes not only the machine learning challenge, but these product questions. How are you going to get a real person to use your product? And, and that is not a question about loss functions or computational complexity. It's, you really have to talk to people. Uh, so we did. And by we, I mean Colin Russell, who's the software engineer who led this. Uh, and I, So Colin realized that he could make a, a bot for this. He called it Blossom Bot. Blossom because it's like a flower. You pour water on it. Blossoms. Uh, and the editors still interact with this bot after like seven years, um, where you can ask the bot, how should I be promoting this story? Or you could ask it, on this particular social platform, what should I be posting right now? from all the different sections. Uh, and there are still editors using this to uh, make suggestions about how they promote the content. And to interrupt you and say, OK, I'm alerting you. You, you really should consider promoting the story right now. That said, um, it's an example of trying to use prediction in the service of prescription. right? So you're making a prediction with and, with, without, with and without different types of promotion. And then that delta is being used to flag a potential action or a potential decision by a human being. And I should say this is an example of data informed but not data driven, meaning it is not the case that the bot posts automatically. It's the post that editors could or could not interact with the bot. And then when the bot makes a suggestion, they could or could not uh, follow that bot's suggestion. Can I ask a question? Please. So what's the algorithm that figures out what the post will go viral? Uh, based on training data, you can uh, predict engagement, let's say, for the next half hour as a function of how people have engaged with it for the last half hour and as a function of attributes of the document. Uh, this is a problem for which there's pretty interesting literature from uh, John Kleinberg, Duncan Watts, all of these people interacting with you know, Yahoo in ancient times or, or Facebook or things like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty well-studied problem. Depending on the platform, it's interesting to see which features matter. 
often you, often you only make this prediction after the story has been published for like 15 minutes. And often the way people engage with it in the first 15 minutes is way more important than any text attributes of the story. So that's the time scale, basically. Yeah. So, so make a story. So publish a story. Wait 15 minutes or 30 minutes. And that is, is a, a very fast indicator of, of, of the way people are going to engage with this story. And it may also give you an indication of how the how this engagement with the story will change if you were to promote it on different channels. Because you know, the internet gives you a lot of data. So like you can see how I mean, people are engaging with the story from search, from social, from different channels. Uh, you, you can get a lot of engagement data pretty quickly. Answers the question? OK. Again, though, it's, it's based on observational data. So it's, it's, uh, it's not something I would, it's not as good as, as RCT data, like something we can do a randomized control trial or where you actually do something interventional more generally. Uh, and that, which brings me to actual problems where you actually can explore. So observational data, you can interpret it as a prescription, uh, but even better is when you are actually the one doing the do. So do in the sense of do calculus of Judea Pearl. Like if, if you have data where you actually did the intervention, then you don't need to worry that you're looking at observational data where the treatment was itself correlated with some attribute of the, of the example. So let me talk about um, how reinforcement learning comes to, uh, to bear. And also just a historical point, working in machine learning in the sciences, I published a bunch of papers on effectively descriptive and, pre and predictive models. In the sciences, there's much less a treatment to uh, prescriptive problems or reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is the natural abstraction if you're trying to interact with the world and actually drive some engagement but if you're trying to understand yeast expression, it's not that you're trying to get yeast to do a particular dance. You just have a lot of data and you want to understand how it works. So uh, let's talk about reinforcement learning. Uh, right. So again, in English, I would say that's a prescriptive model. But the technical uh, corner of machine learning that's useful here, really useful here, is reinforcement learning. So if you haven't heard about reinforcement learning, um, there's been a lot more attention. Like if you pick up a textbook on machine learning from more than two or three years ago, it was probably a textbook about supervised and unsupervised learning, which to be fair is the same thing that, that textbooks have been talking about since Duda and Hart, 1973. Like supervised and unsupervised learning have been the main uh, problems in, in machine learning for most of its history. Reinforcement learning has been getting more and more attention in part uh, because of a, rival a revival of getting computers to play games against themselves. And to be fair, the, the first usage of the term machine learning in, in a paper was about exactly that, trying to get a computer to play chess by playing against itself. So uh, in 2016, there was this uh, paper about getting a computer to play all of the games, uh, the Atari games. There used to be a game called Atari. Now you can uh, have a computer play itself. So that was an early win for reinforcement learning, was to get computers to win all these Atari games. More recently, Go got a lot of attention the, the next year, uh, again, using reinforcement learning techniques, but gives, using fake data, I mean, data from a computer playing itself over and over again. Um, it became part of the whole branding of a number of technology companies that they were going to use deep Q learning networks. Um, so if you hang out in industry, you've probably heard of reinforcement learning. It does in G indeed generate like eye-popping results in these sort of toy world environments where you can get all the data you want by having a computer play a game. This was a good example from, I think, 2020, where they got a computer to win a bunch of Atari games, not by maximizing the score, but just by doing things that are surprising. And it turned out to be a very good strategy for getting a computer to play video games. Although, to be fair, video games are designed in such a way that the thing that you do that surprises you is the thing that actually gets you to the next level. So, uh, but still, it's pretty cool. Um, and then you, I mean, you can Google reinforcement learning at any point now and get a bunch of news articles. But I just chose one recently, last week. There's this one from OpenAI about getting a computer to play Minecraft, which was interesting to me because although I do not play Minecraft, there are other many multiple people in my house who play Minecraft. And so having watched Minecraft over their shoulder, I know that it's a good idea to chop down a tree to make a crafting table. I've never actually done it myself. So. Uh, this is a, a video that came out a week ago today uh, where somebody shows that you can get a computer to use reinforcement learning and do all sorts of ridiculously complicated things in the Minecraft world. It, it, like you don't just move around and shoot things. You have to you know, pick up planks from logs or, or make planks from logs or something like that. So these are examples. They're sort of eye-popping examples from um, mostly industry and mostly from cases where 
you use reinforcement learning on fake data because it's a game. You can generate all the data you can eat. Um, there are, though, biophysical examples of reinforcement learning in the sense of how do we make models of an agent that interacts with the world in order to get some goal, not necessarily to maximize likelihood, but to, for example, find food. Uh, an example was this thought experiment from uh, Stan Ulam when he was at Los Alamos, and this was written up by um, physicist Michael Goldhaber, who's coming from particle physics. So Ulam proposed this problem. Imagine that there's a scalar field in space, which is uh, diffusive uh, recognition of food, and then there's something like smell, and an agent somehow has to use the signal in order to follow gradients. So this is an old idea from physicists thinking about biology. Um, Ten years later, it was definitely on the minds of people when they started doing real experiments with E. coli trying to find food. Uh, Howard Berg uh, was doing this at Colorado with these beautiful three-dimensional tracking uh, experiments. What he rapidly realized is E. coli is very small, right? It's like a micron in size. It's too small to compute a gradient. It simply just has a temporal signal for food, and its strategy is to develop a run and tumble strategy. Th th basically, its whole action space is two things. Either you pull the run arm or you pull the tumble arm over and over again, and it has its own little algorithm for trying to go to places where there's more food. So that's a biophysical example of a very simple reinforcement learning. And this is still an active field today. Um, a good example is this paper by um, Massimo Vericasola, who's known to many of us here. Um, and he's written several papers specifically about um, the reinforcement learning attributes of chemotaxis. An another biophysical example for reinforcement learning is this paper last year uh, by a group from Japan understanding the immune system as reinforcement learning. What's the paradigm there? The paradigm there is to think about the world as handing you some reward. And again, this is not, it's not that you're trying to predict something in the absence of treatment. It's about you're trying to optimize uh, actions in order to get that reward. So the world gives you some reward. That's a function of the actions you can do. I'm not sure if there's a pointer. Uh, OK, it's a, actions you can do and also the current state of the world. Um, so you observe the state of the world S. You perform an action A. It's drawn from some stochastic policy, which is the analog of running or tumbling. Uh, and then two things happen. You get a reward that's related to what action you took and what state you, um, you knew about before you took the action. But also, the world evolves into some new state. And so the really challenging reinforcement learning problem for playing Minecraft is to learn at the same time the reward you're going to get if you do a certain action and also the transition to a new state. So let's think about something simpler. A slightly simpler case is ignore the fact that the world has a state, like in Minecraft, you try to put the table up or something like that, and just consider a world in which every single observation is independent of every other observation. Mathematically, that's much simpler, um, and it turns out to be the right abstraction for many things that are done in industry. That abstraction of reinforcement without a state is sometimes called the context of bandits. So the reason this is called bandits is because uh, of an analogy drawn by uh, the statistician Mausbauer in the 1950s to the one-armed bandit. One-armed bandit is a phrase in English for a slot machine. Uh, and if you imagine that there are multiple slot machines, then you are trying to choose which slot machines to give your money to. And you're not interested in maximizing likelihood. It's not like you're trying to figure out exactly what the payoff is of every one of the arms, including the bad arms. What you're trying to do is make as much money as possible. So that abstraction is called bandits. Uh, and that turns out to be a very useful abstraction for industry. For example, uh, New York Times is not the only people doing this. There's this um, startup called Stitch Fix, which employed like literally hundreds of data scientists and had a great blog about data science. And one of their many blog posts was about using bandits in order to personalize. So when you personalize using a bandit, the state S is everything you know about the reader, in this case. And the action A is which item you're presenting to the reader. And then the reward, R as a function of A and S, is like, did they click or did they purchase? So it's, it's, a, it's a very natural abstraction for all of business, as well as you know, being a robot or being a doctor or something like that. Um, we also use it at the New York Times. So I said earlier that we had done some descriptive modeling in order to do recommendation engines. We now do that by prescriptive modeling, specifically with bandits. And there's a nice blog post about this from uh, Dr. Anna Conan uh, from 2019 about specifically using contextual bandits. Uh, I would say it's prescriptive rather than descriptive. We no longer try to infer one topic model over everything and everyone. 
Um, we can make things very simple with very few features or very complex, uh, depending on what we think is the appropriate um, setting. And again, in data science, that is when you are applying machine learning with another human being, often that interpretability really matters. Editors really want to understand how the algorithms work. Uh, often those, the modeling choices give in, uh, insights that start to inform how you might build better algorithms, how you might build uh, new products. The, speaking slightly more technically, the idea is to take a randomized control trial and then slightly bias the probability that you do one of the different variants. So the idea of a randomized control trial has been around since like Fisher in 1925. Uh, but the idea in a bandit is slowly upweight the option that seems to be winning as a function of time. Mathematically, there are many, many ways to do that. So just to give you some ideas to start thinking about how you would abstract this, one is to say I'm going to do action A with a probability that is, um, with probability epsilon, I'm going to do a completely random thing. With probability 1 minus epsilon, I will do the thing that seems to be the best. Uh, another technique, upper confidence bound, is a technique that says, I'm going to look at the upper confidence bound, so I'll estimate the mean and a variance for every action, and I'll take the thing that seems to be the best. Intuitively, that seems to work well, because if you do it a lot, that error bar will shrink, and eventually if it shrinks down so that the upper bound is below somebody else, you will stop doing the bad thing. There's also a way in which you could just use probability, which is my favorite. Um, it's called Thompson sampling. It dates from 1933. It requires you to be much more Bayesian. You have to be willing to write down a parameterized model. Um, and, but it's, it, it turns out to work very, very well. So it's a paper published in 1933, which absolutely nobody paid attention to for decades. So if nobody's citing your paper, take heart. You know, maybe what you need to do is wait 80 years. And then industry like, rediscovered this approach and also discovered that it works. Uh, and so that has become a very popular source of literature uh, in bandits. OK, so I. I'm running short of time, but I, I wanted to say a little bit about the abstraction for Thompson sampling. Um, the idea is to look at, I, I choose an act or an action according to the probability that it is the best action. So uh, that you can think of as marginalizing out all the parameters in your model. Or you could sample a random value of the parameters and then given that, param that parameter uh, draw from a distribution, namely the posterior distribution, posterior probability of the parameters given the data you've seen, Given that uh, parameter realization, what's the best arm? So that turns out to be a, a random algorithm that uh, works very well and is very simple to uh, write down and very simple to write code for. For example, let's say that the reward is either 0 or 1, so you have a Bernoulli distribution. Then all you need to do is keep track of the counts. The whole state variable is the number of successes for arm A and the number of failures for arm A. And that's it. For K arms, that's a little 2 by 2 table of successes and failures. That's all the sufficient statistics you need to update uh, as you run the bandit. Um, OK, so a natural question is, for Thompson sampling in particular, the computational challenge and, alg and algorithmic challenge is, can you uh, draw samples from a posterior distribution? If you're willing to write down a probability model, uh, how do you draw samples from the posterior? That is something which statistical physics knows well. And there are many methods from statistical physics for approximating distributions. Uh, so some of the literature, OK, so as I mentioned earlier, when I showed up at the New York Times, I knew supervised and unsupervised learning reasonably well, but I hadn't done much in, in reinforcement learning. So some of the research that's been inspired by problems at the New York Times is, what if the real world is arbitrarily complex? So for example, uh, if I want to make a parameterized distribution, what if it's underspecified or misspecified and the real world is a mess? So one way to make arbitrarily complicated probability distributions is called mixture modeling. If you're going to make something that's a mixture model, uh, there's a natural technique for uh, simulating or for approximating that distribution using variational techniques. In physics, if you've ever used a test Hamiltonian, you have used a variational technique. Um, so if you'd like to know more about that, um, there's some preprints uh, of work with me and uh, Dr. Inigo Ortega. Um, and the second question is, and this is particularly relevant for the news, because the news is always changing, is what if the distribution that you're trying to optimize over is, in fact, changing in time? Uh, so we've also been working on some computational techniques using Monte Carlo methods, specifically sequential importance sampling, where we allow the parameters themselves to drift in time. 
Um, and we can show that that turns out to be a, a, a good technique even for news itself, thanks to some data that Yahoo opened up years ago, which are now one of the sort of standard data sets for people developing reinforcement learning methods. OK. Oh, and then very more recent work is to ask, can I say an anything analytically about the dynamics of a bandit? Um, it's, it sounds like a simple probability flow, but because the action is a function of prior outcomes, it's actually uh, coupled in a way that makes uh, analytic work rather complicated. So that's some work in progress, and I'll just uh, show at least a little bit of results there. To show you that everything you know in physics is useful in reinforcement learning, um, the idea of variational methods is to take a probability distribution in which many variables have some uh, dependence, meaning they're not independent, and ask, what if I approximate that complicated joint distribution with a joint distribution which, which factorizes? And things factorize when you approximate by uh, ignoring some of the dependence of the variables. So in this case, for contextual bandits which are trying to interact with the world or maybe personalize, uh, you have uh, mixtures, uh, and those mixtures imply a particular uh, likelihood that you will draw from uh, one of the, let's, let's, let's imagine a Gaussian mixture model. So you might draw from one of the bumps. Uh, but if you simply break one of those edges, you get something that's analytically tractable and also gives you an algorithm you can run. So you get interpretability. You can actually understand how a different uh, example is associated with one of the mixtures. You can understand what the, the means and the variances are of the different mixtures, and you get something that's performant. So what does it look like? Well, when you were young and somebody showed you the icing model and they said, let's approximate the icing model by m equals tanh m over and over again, that iterative equation, m equals tanh m, actually comes from a variational approach. If you look at papers on variational methods, including ours, you will see similar things, just worse. So there's a couple of parameters to keep track. It's not just the overall magnetization. We can iterate those to convergence, and that gives us the, most, the best approximate model. If you've ever seen non-parametric statistical inference, you will know that the joy of non-parametrics is, as the model, as the data become, if the, if the data seem to be complex, you can add to the complexity of your model by adding new mixtures. If you've ever heard of Chinese restaurant processes or a pit manure process, um, these ideas are that you can make the, mo the model more complex. So uh, we showed how to do that for um, contextual bandits as well. So these are mathematical statements, but in the literature, you also need some results. Um, so we also have some actual computational results with fake data. These are fake data showing that you can take really good methods, like methods that have a neural net behind them. So it's taking all of the context as input, and they do pretty well for a while. Uh, and then you can take uh, this approach of ours called non-parametric Thompson sampling and show that it eventually wins. And win in this case actually is to shove the lower line. In the literature of reinforcement learning, the thing you're trying to do is minimize regret rather than maximize reward. And so being at the bottom of the graph means that you won, uh, which is our red line at the bottom. Um, yes, and then as I said earlier, uh, one of the other things that the challenges that the New York Times made me start thinking about was, well, what if the world is constantly changing? Could you do uh, contextual bandits with the changing world? So uh, another one of our papers is about uh, considering the situation where you posit a transition model for the parameters in the model. Those models slightly drift. Um, se uh, sequential importance sampling turns out to be a natural framework for this, where you look back over prior things that you did um, and sample from that distribution. You allow the parameters there to, to drift somewhat. And it allows you to do things like deal with a changing world. So this is, again, a fake data set in which suddenly at time 250 and time 1250, all of the payoffs changed. And you can see how the model responds. There's a, a breakpoint at 250 and another breakpoint at 1250, where a different arm becomes the best arm to play. Or you can do it with real data. Um, and again, I mentioned Yahoo. Uh, back when Yahoo had a research group, um, released a bunch of their data from Yahoo News. And this is now one of the standard data sets for reinforcement learning, uh, is to look at um, the importance of different news stories. So what you're seeing here is an algorithm that chooses with different functions of time the probability that that's the news item you should show to people. And these news stories have their own dynamics. They are news for a while, and then they're no longer news. Or you might have pieces that stay really interesting to people for a long, long time. In more recent work, and this is a uh, work in progress with uh, Urteaga, as, along with Harish Bhatt and uh, Marianne Bauer and Trevor Grand Prey, uh, we've been looking about whether or not you can say anything analytically about the flow of bandits. Um, so 
instead of bounding things, you can approximate things. So that's one of the things we've been working on is what are the approximate techniques for understanding the probability flow of bandits. Uh, and the important thing to see here is that the light blue line and the red line do a really good job matching up with the, um, the blue line and the red line. I guess another thing to see in this graph is that there's a high variance. Bandits are high variance techniques. And when you simulate it, you have to do many, many realizations before you get a nice smooth curve which was another reason why I thought it would be nice not to do any simulations and to instead say something analytically about the flow of these probabilities. So this is for a policy called Epsilon Greedy, which I mentioned earlier. This is for Thompson sampling, which I also mentioned earlier, just to show you that um, simple analytics and a little pencil paper can at least give you the start of a numerical technique. OK, uh, I'll wrap uh, by closing and encouraging if you want to know more about the sort of uh, less technical aspects. There's a, a, a non-technologist book coming out in the next year that's really based on this class that I've been teaching with a history professor on the history and ethics of data. And if you want to know more about the technical aspects, particularly why data science and industry has challenges around developing product in addition to the machine learning challenges, uh, that's more this book from Cambridge Press that'll be out next year. Uh, the hard work was done by the group of data scientists at the New York Times. This is a partial photo. It doesn't include the summer interns, but you can see that there's about 22 people coming from a variety of different disciplines. Uh, and then the academic work, if you'd like to know more about it, um, the preprints that are available are online. And then the work in progress is work in progress, but I'm happy to discuss uh, individually. And with that, I think I've reached the end. So thank you again for the invitation, Alex. It's wonderful to be back in Paris, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks.